And he's walking the bed through the stuff until I left to the end. <laughs> Just in case it's not up for the Right. Uh, yeah, me talking about the old the Elizabethan red size. Uh, size I was involved with back even before when I knew BT in the early 90s up until about 96, and then I've been re involved with again since about 2012. And I'm conscious of the fact that in the intervening years, things happen that I'm going to talk about. So I'm standing on the shoulders of, of many other people here. So the first question, perhaps, is where is Alderney? Well, we are here in Portsmouth. Alderney is part of the British Channel Islands, situated off the coast of France. It's not part of the United Kingdom, it's not part of the UK, but it's part of the British Islands, and it is a uh, crown protectorate. So it has an unusual legal status. It's also a long way from anywhere. It's three square miles in size, two small flights a day, one cargo about once a week. So we've got a lot of project there. It's not the simplest place to get to. A bit of, oh, give me a slide away. A bit about the to the island, three square miles in size, 14 artillery forts, the oldest of which is Roman, the most recent of which is Second World War. One primary harbour here that was built in the middle of the 19th century as a harbour of refuge for the Royal Navy, um, as a forward base for them. Uh, occupied, this is one of the Victorian books, occupied as was all of the Channel Islands by the German army during the Second World War. Uh, most of the elderly population left just before the occupation. It was extensively fortified by the Germans as part of the Atlantic War, and it's the only place in the British Isles where there was a concentration camp, which is a unique, but black, unhappy circumstance. And the nod to the talk of yesterday, it's the only part of the British Isles that's been subject to the bombardment of the largest shells the Royal Navy has ever used, which are 16 inch shells from HMS Rodney, which in 1944, when the island engaged American troops attacking Cherbourg, fired 72 rounds of uh, uh, 16 inch shell at the island. They all fell within 200 metre radius on a German battery that was back in action the following day. So it isn't that easy to, uh, to defeat them. And if you're wondering why the Channel Islands are part of the British Isles, it's because a thousand years ago, men from that part of the world crossed the English Channel and conquered England. So we are part of them rather than the other way around. But, oh. The, wreck. Uh, the story of the wreck goes back to the late 1970s when this fisherman, Bertie Cottrell, caught a complete musket in his lobster pot, recovered it. As a result of that, the, uh, the site where he came from was dived by a local salvage diver called Fred Shaw, who was the individual there, who dived on it, realised a couple of pounds, didn't really do, do much with it again until the early late 80s, early 1990s, when the salvage divers and a group of others on the island formed the diving club, went looking for interesting sites, and started to recover material from this site in large lumps. There's one of the lumps that they recovered, uh, and then finally it started to get into circulation. There's some pictures of the site in more recent days, a combination of flat sands and a low rocky reef. It's positioned immediately to the northwest of the island, <coughs> just here, adjacent to a reef called the Ledge, in about 30 metres of water. And that water contains some of the fastest moving water in the English Channel. You get tides, tidal speeds across the, the, the site there, up to seven knots on speed. And it's a site that you can only reasonably dive about 40 minutes a day. So again, it's a logistical difficult place to go to. It's also an area that because of these tides, has historically been an anchorage, a ship's anchor waiting for the tide to turn in their favour in order to come around the islands. It's marked as an anchorage on this 18th century chart just up here somewhere. And it is largely good holding ground. It's a combination of sand and rock. There's always a chance for other material from, from ships that have anchored there to be deposited 
And we've got the table within the collection that's as old as Roman and as, as modern as the 20th century. Uh, so the bathymetric survey of the site, we give you an idea of the topography. This is the ledge here, which rises to within about three metres of the surface. This is the site of the ledge site here, which is about 20, 28, 29 metres, coming down on the sand, which is where you've got rock, rock leaves and sand. And an idea of the layout of the site, that's a photograph dramatic survey of the site. Again, you can see uh, sand and, and low sandstone reef. There's a number of cannons there. Six in total, although I've got seven objects marked there. The ones that are marked in red are still present on the seabed. The ones that are marked in yellow have been raised. We'll come to those in a moment. The one that's marked uh, in orange is a completion, large completion, for some people who argue it's a good, but I don't think it is. Uh, you may have seen publications on this site before that show as many as 22 cameras. Well, there aren't. There are six in the mid 90s, and you can account for six now. So, unless they migrated in and migrated out, there aren't any. Um, there's a number of bits of ship structure, but there is no real, well, there's no real ship as far as we've seen. Uh, although there could be ship structure buried in the deep of Santa here. There was one large item when the site was found, which is the stern post and the rudder, which is there, or well, that's been raised, and we'll see that in a bit. The final distribution, we know where about two thirds of the material that comes from the site has come from, and most of it is in this area, which would suggest to me that's roughly where the layout of the wreck is. And in fact, the distance between the rudder, which is about there, and the foremost two cannons, and there's, a, there's an anchor there as well, is about 26 metres, which perhaps can give you a, a, um, a length for the originating ship. Um, just to give you an idea of the date of the ceramics, and this was the first thing that dated the back. It was originally generally thought when the material was first being discovered to be 18th century. There wasn't any real logic in that, it was just a date that was picked. Um, when the ceramics were looked at by Bob Burns, who was then the archaeologist of Guernsey, he put a date on them between 15, uh, 1550 and 1620. Largely um, either English, Dutch, with a, some small amounts of French material in there. Other things that can give us an idea of sort of date or handling is to hand weight, both lead. The sword is the city of London, EL is a stamp that we know was used in the latter part of Elizabeth the first reign. The stamp is first mentioned in a proclamation, proclamation in 1587, and Elizabeth dies in 1603. So the stamp may well have been in use before 1587, and presumably these things stayed in use after the death of the monarch. But it's giving you a late, late 16th, early 17th century date. <laughs> Uh, we've also got a small number of smoking pipes, one of which is pewter, and the other one which is a clay pipe. These are particularly early tobacco pipes, and if the date of the wreck is right, I understand, I don't want to stick my neck out here, that's the oldest dated clay pipe in existence in the British Isles. This one's pewter, there are a few metal pipes in existence. They don't seem to have stayed in use for too long, but I suspect that's because you light a fire in this, and the other end of the deep is up to his mouth, uh, which I presume was good, I don't know. Um, other things that have given us a date there's this small hawk cover, and it is small. Um, a dendro date from that day was a date of 1587. There's no sapwood on that. That's not the felling date, it's a date in which it was growing. Um, It's very small, in fact it's smaller than the giant for the guns on the site, which suggests it's not a gun book. Um, the best example, or the best match I've seen for that is by Colin Martin, it's from the Jewett Point wreck, and that's exactly the same size, and that, that was an all port for Swiss. So you could suggest by that one port that the ship was equipped with Swiss. 
Uh, in, times, in terms of historical information about Brits on the island, uh, there are a number of candidates from the late 16th, the late 16th, early 17th century. The best documented is this one, which is a ship that was cast away about Alderney, and that's mentioned in a letter written in November 1592 about an event that occurred earlier that autumn, and that's written by an individual called Sir John Novis, who was um, uh, an English general at the time, the head of an army in France, writing to England complaining about a lot of things. Um, so perhaps, and that was also a campaign in which troops had just been moved from the Low Countries into Brittany, and newly recruited troops had been moved from England into Brittany, with the idea of preventing uh, a takeover of Brittany by the Catholic League that could have led to another rival against England. So you've got this letter associated with troop movement operations from those countries. Uh, the guns from the Northerners Conference, so well into the White Cannon. Uh, six, possibly seven, I've explained that already. Three of, be, three of which have been recovered. All the ones on the scene bed are the exact same length as the ones that have been recovered. So the presumption is that they're all the same. Uh, the ones that have been recovered, this illustration of the first one, they're all identical, they're all minions. They've got engraved into them their weight. Which is done in England after they are proof, and they all have been broken to the 1400 weight, zero quarter, zero pound. Talking to people here, the assumption would be that they weighed one, they're made in the same batch potentially, they weighed one, and the weight is associated with them all. Um, they're all set, which, which means they weigh, or they would have weighed initially, almost 750 kilograms, they're not that big. Uh, they're seven foot long. They've got a ball of three and a half inches. One of them is marked with an FW that may be a founder's mark, but if that's the case, we don't know who that founder is. And we don't know, or oh, I've not heard of any other examples of that mark being used. And when they were all found, as the crucian stripped off them, they were all lashed. So presumably they were lashed for transit. And the whole moment we know again ships are loaded at sea so as well as a gun you've got uh, the Tompion, the Waddy, the remains of the Founder Charge and the Ball they're all loaded with round shot Okay, so that's the And a couple of them have the fragments of carriages This is the first gun photographed in 93 lying on the seabed with a cabbage remaining on it. At that point it was thought to be a fragment of the cabbage, but actually it's the almost complete cabbage because this flat here, which is there, is flattened off to fit on the cabbage bed. So that is the full size of it, giving it a height, a uh, length of about three and a half feet, uh, a height of about 18 inches. It's fairly thick wood, you know, it's got cheap there. Uh, the cannon was on the maximum elevation of the gun that would give, which is about 8 degrees, which is quite flat, I think. Uh, probably had a bed, an axle, and trucks, so those don't survive. There was one truck, truck wheel found there, about 8 inches diameter, which was found separately on the side. The best uh, comparison for that is this one, uh, which was by Tay Smith, which is in the, in that town. In Windsor Castle. So you're probably looking at something, how would you then look roughly like this? Which then look exactly like the carriages. So the, the, the Matthew Baker's phone information, ship like we published around then, which show these new gun carriages on board English warships, which are the truck carriages that you would associate with that, well, a version of the truck carriage that you would associate with uh, the one you see on victory. And also you see the beginnings of on the Mary Rogers. <coughs> In terms of ammunition, uh, all the round shot about 80 millimetres in diameter. Weigh would have originally weighed about four pounds. Probably number of these at the moment. 
crossbar shot. Don't know any trouble up high big man to this. Uh, same size ball, but with a, a it's a cast iron ball with a wall top cast around a wall iron bar. One of them has got a single casting mark of an R height, the others don't have anything. Uh, and the tip to tip, maximum tip to tip length of these bars is about 370 mil on a, on a 12 mil cross section. And there's some jockey evidence I'm told that you could wrap these in a prepared rope or fuse and fire and then put a burn into the bar. I would presume that they would also speed in the air and would be quite good at chopping down really all over a uh, short range. The other type of shot that you've got, and I apologise for the terrible uh, scans right there, are these bar shots. So you've got cast um, a lead head, joined by a bar, and this is as they were originally seen at this point, we thought this was just a, a single bar between them, and almost to the point that you could have cast these on board the ship. Um, maximum length of 350 millimetres, another 12 metre, 10 millimetre cross section. I'm told the earliest historical evidence for bar shot is around about 1595. I'm more than happy to be corrected uh, about that. So this makes these possibly, maybe, could be the earliest ideological <coughs> examples. But when you think originally, simple two two leg hemispheres with a bit of bar between them is quite simple. Until you X-ray them, and they're not that simple. They're actually expanding bars. When you look at them, oh, right, are they? When you look at them there, you see they're on two separate bars because they push together to many fires that expand out with the spin when it's there for chopping up rigging or people because it gets people on So you've got you know, a range of ordinance, but the one thing that you don't have, just make a picture of that, these are not from this wreck, but every other wreck I've been involved with in the 16th and early 17th century, they got palaces of shot. Well, there's none being because of it. Now, that could be because the way most of the material recovered from the site was done with the initial discovery and salvage, and things were brought up, not from an archaeological perspective, but brought to the roots. It could be that that just hasn't been found, it could be that they haven't survived, and it could be that they've never on board. But I also thought it was worth mentioning the fact that something that occurs virtually everywhere else <coughs> isn't there. And in terms of numbers, and again, the site hasn't been estimated in its entirety, so the numbers are just those that have been recovered. But by far, the majority of material is round shots, over 40, just over 10 cross bar shots, and then six bar shots. Now, given there's six guns, which gives a broadside of three guns, you've got 14 broadsides with the round shots. Four with the crossbar and two with the bar shot. Is that a lot of ammunition or not? Don't know. Um, there has, there was after the, the, the second recovery of, of guns on the site around 2008, a replica of one of them was made. It was actually a replica of them all because they're identical uh, and was tested by firing both round shots. There's the impact from a round shot there, the crossbar shot, um, bar shot, and I found out today that the bar shot, and whilst we haven't got a picture of it, went straight through the wooden target. It's going to be a spectacular image, uh, and probably the most interesting uh, part of what you've got there. But what else is on board? It's not just a ship and cannons, they've got other things. There's a whole pile of armour, for example. Uh, and again, there is still armour on the seabed, so this isn't in its entirety. There's ten helmets, ten breastplates, a single back plate. Some of it, if you look there, you see that was stacked. And we've got two helmets that are inside each other. So again, it's not it's somebody isn't wearing this, it's installed, or it's been stored, or it's been transported. <coughs> And you've got a pile of firearms, one of which is in, in our little cabin downstairs. Uh, you've got this thing, which is a rampart gun with a, with a tang there that would be hooked over a wall to be fired to take the water and leave oil. Uh, you've got these arm pussies here, which are, which are lighter weapons. You've got muskets, and you've got one staff on musket, which is a version of flintlock, which would be quite an expensive object, which is the one up here. 
All of these, these were raised during the initial years and don't survive very well. This one is almost complete. So you've got how many there? 10. So 10 sets of armour, 10 firearms in various forms, ranging from 15 millimeter to 25 millimeter. <coughs> so shot of almost an inch in diameter. But we also know that there are more of them on the seat there. And there's a group of firearms, possibly in a box, and there are other examples of that down there. The stuff that is on the surface isn't the, isn't the entire collection. Uh, other things that have come up, powder flasks, that's just a loose one. There's four on the surface. Uh, three of them are probably for use with a man charge, one of which is, is decorated, and a smaller one that may well have been a prime. Uh, other things, these cute little uh, ceramic pots which have actually had hand grenades. There's at least 29 of those in a series of fragments. Uh, Bobo's wear probably from France. And these charged containers which are worn in bandoliers around, uh, around soldiers. These are all proper ones that are exceptionally unusual, but there's 33 of those. And again, there hasn't been. So this is only an example of what can be found. Uh, there's a number of edge weapons, 14 in total, one of which was, is complete. This complete one was raised by us because all the others have been damaged. You can see them there in recovery. And actually the x-rays of that, that show that's very similar to this one that's in the town in the Leeds Armoury collection. So that's the kind of thing that you're looking at. Uh, so what have we got? Well, as well as the cannons, you've got the quick complete infantry equipment, the complete equipment of an infantry soldier of the period. And interestingly, 40, 50 years after the Sinko and Mary Rose, no long bones, it's all fine. So uh, the, the, the army or soldiers have moved on from that. Other things, uh, question equipment. Two originally gilded stirrups, one potentially gilded spur, which would suggest the, uh, the presence of either an officer or cavalry soldiers, because you don't tend to get horses involved in naval warfare. <laughs> uh, and a whole pile of surgical equipment. Uh, you've got Alberello jug drawers, this pollinger here that may or may not be associated with the surgery, but where used. And with a name on the bottom, which is the cause. And this thing, which I cannot pronounce, but it's basically a wounded line of the shear where you push it into the wound and you open it up to open up the wound and pull the object out in the good old days, right? <laughs> this is proper surgical equipment. This isn't the ship's captain cueing somebody's uh, headache. So this would imply the presence of a surgeon. There's also a sword. Maybe a surgical sword. So you've got a horseman, at least one, and you've got a surgeon. And you've got these things, which are pipkins, mainly from the low countries, at least 10 of them. And these are individual cooking pots. And they're being used because they're sooty. And these are your mess tin of the period, which would imply that the troops on board are not part of the ship's crew. They're soldiers that are being moved, as would the surgeon, because the ship is too small. It should be too small to have its own surgeon, as is the horse man, because you don't have a on the ship. So you've got a, 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 a naval vessel and a group of troops in transport, which actually fits back into the uh, the veterans at the beginning. Uh, how big is it? Well, the wood was raised, there's all the calculations there, right? But that wood, could have been used on a ship anywhere between 30 to 25 metres long. The fines distribution on the seabed is about 26 metres across, which tend, would tend to be quite fairly long. Uh, the anchors would suggest a ship a bit smaller, so perhaps it would be long and thin, uh, which fits into actually the historic reference again, because we think it might have been a pillars, which is a small main vessel, uh, was involved in this activity. But not one is a royal ship, these aren't royal guns, there's no royal ship lost at the time. 
this is something that uh, is, a, is, is a private private warship on hire, perhaps. So what does it all mean? Well, that's a date, we've been through that. It's got a mainly English character, some Dutch, and that's going to come from the country being moved. It's a small private warship, a transport vessel. It's got a high status of uh, horseman, possibly a military officer. Uh, the presence of a military surgeon, because the ship's probably too small for its own surgeon. Presence on board of a small group of soldiers, but a possibly part of a larger group, because such a small group wouldn't have its own surgeon. The surgeon would belong <coughs> to a, to a regiment rather than a small company. The naval ordnance is all matched. All the guns are the same size, all the ammunition is the same size, and that's in direct comparison to the Mary Rose, but never range of ammunition. And if you've ever looked at Colin Martin's work from Imada, where they've got everything you can imagine on board to one ship. So somebody thought this through, this agreed the logistical organisation in terms of the naval army, because any bit of ammunition on the ship would fit any of the guns. The military equipping, it's a range of everything, different bores, different sizes, armour coming from different areas, which would suggest a lack of organi uh, logistical organisation. But bearing in mind, if it is the end of the 16th century, the English army involved had been in the field for three years and had been scouting the front opposition. And uh, the counties who equipped the army had had enough of fighting wars and they weren't sending anything of any value with anybody who left their county. So, uh, this is sort of the, the contrast being the Naval organisation appears organised and thought through, the military organisation appears <coughs> slightly more chaotic. And so to say, <coughs> these are all the people that have helped with this. Most of you know I'm dyslexic, I'm going to get a German to spell check it beforehand, so thank you for Angela there. Uh, and I put dot dot dot, I was bound to remember, uh, forget somebody and I just realised Nicole's name isn't on there. It is, well, I didn't forget it. I must have forgotten somebody else in that case. <laughs> so that's the end of my talk. But just to go with the permission of BT go for sh shameless promotion of our conference at Bournemouth University, I'll leave that up there for now. <laughs>